Okay, uh, WAP students, welcome back. It's been a little while since I've done these, but uh, this is chapter eight, uh, part one. Maybe we can get it all in uh, one session here, but uh, what we're going to talk about in this chapter really is just two uh, Chinese dynasties, the Qin dynasty and the Han dynasty, and really the, the main idea of this chapter is this search for social order. You know, the last Chinese dynasty we left off with was the Zhou dynasty, and we talked about the Warren States period and how uh, basically, decentralization kind of helped spell doom for China. All the lords were fighting with each other, and it was just chaos. It was kind of like the dark ages of China, if you will. And after a couple hundred years of that, there's this search for restoring social order, going back to the good old days, if you will. Um, basically, three schools of thought emerged to try to um, bring back that, restore that social order. Uh, there were Confucianism, Daoism, and Legalism. Now, we'll start with Confucianism. Confucianism, founded by a guy named, uh, Com well, we just know him as Confucius. That's what we know him as. Uh, he had another Chinese name, but uh, for our purposes, Confucius would be just fine. Uh, Confucius was a guy that had a lot of ambition. He wasn't very likable, um, and so he kind of was never able to get uh, to achieve the ambition that he wanted. He wanted to be this high-ranking minister, and he never quite made it there. Uh, but he wasn't an advisor to politicians at times. He was certainly a teacher, um, you know, and and he made an impact, a tremendous impact. But he never, in his own life, got as high as he wanted to get, mostly because he was kind of a grumpy old bear, if you will. Um, Confucianism is, is based around basically five basic relationships. Confucius believed that if a father treated a son in a certain way and a son respected a father in a certain way, well, then that would help restore social order. That if a husband treated a wife a certain way and if a wife deferred to a husband uh, in a certain way, if a brother to a brother treated the brothers with a certain amount of respect, you know, the uh, subject to the ruler, if they treated them with a certain, you know, the ruler was responsible for taking care of his subjects and stuff like that. If this was all done, then social order could be uh, reestablished and we could get moved beyond the Warren States period. Now, Confucianism was never something that a lot of your leaders in China liked because it kind of it wanted them to uh, treat the subject in a certain way. So they didn't really gravitate towards Confucianism, especially early on. Now, the second belief system, and these are belief systems. These aren't religions. Don't confuse the two. They're, they're not gods. Confucius was never considered a god. He was a man. All right? But it's a belief system. Uh, Daoism is also a belief system. Dao, Daoists follow something called the way. Basically, it's a balance and harmony in, in, in nature, yin and yang and stuff like that. And they believed if everybody did what they were supposed to do, you know, if the lion eats the gazelle, then the lion eats the gazelle. If everybody knew their proper row, the universe is in harmony. If the gazelles start eating the lions, then we got an issue. And so if people step out of their place in society, that's when we start having issues in China. So, Daoism was kind of like what I call the hippie uh, religion of China. Uh, they were kind of relaxed, laid back. Uh, they were also the, the, if you're a Confucius or even a legalist, um, you could adopt some virtues of Daoism into your daily life. Okay, so, But Daoism uh, didn't make quite the impact that the other two belief systems did. Now, the third belief system is legalism. And legalism can be very harsh. Um, the theory of legalism puts forth that if people um, do things the right way, then you reward them, and that will give them incentive to always do things the right way. But it also says that if somebody does something wrong, that they need to be punished very harshly. And in practice, they tended to punish more than they did reward for, for good behavior. Um, going back to Confucianism for just a minute, there were kind of two proponents there. Uh, there was a man named Mencius. Uh, who believed that people were basically good. When you, when cut and dry, at the end of the day, most people were actually pretty good people. Now, his counterpart was a man named Zunzi, who believed that people were naturally selfish. And they both believed in Confucianism, but they kind of stood on opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, legalism is going to be the one that is adopted by uh, the two dynasties that we talk about in this period, which is the classical period uh, in China. Now, the first dynasty we need to talk about, and again, think, and when you're thinking of your themes, is certainly politics right here. Uh, the last part about the belief systems, kind of social, uh, social and politics as well. But the Qin dynasty. Now, the Qin dynasty uh, was very short-lived, only 14 years, and it had two emperors. 
But its first emperor was a very, very influential man, a very harsh man named Shi Wang Di. That was his adopted name that meant first emperor. He was the first emperor in hundreds of years since the Warren States period. Now, the best thing that he does is he comes in and he standardizes everything in China. Uh, he makes them all write the same language. Before that point, there were different types of Chinese. He says, nope, we're all going to write this kind of Chinese. Uh, he comes in and he says, uh, card axles are all going to be so wide. Uh, weights and measurements are all going to be standardized. And this made trade economics of China a lot more efficient, a lot better. Very efficient with the Qin Dynasty. Um, very harsh. He was a legalist. He was not a fan of Confucius. Uh, he burned as many as 400 Confucian scholars uh, alive. Um, he burned a lot of books. He didn't want people to have knowledge. He wanted control. He just wanted people to follow his orders. He felt like he could do it better than anyone else. Listen to him and, and let's move on. Um, the big idea behind the uh, Qin Dynasty was centralization. None of that decentralization that the Zhou Dynasty brought in and led to the Warren States period. We are going to be, everything is going to run through the emperor. Uh, he's going to see a million people die building his Great Wall of China, but he's going to get it built. So he had results, but in the end, the people are going to hate him. He's famous for his tomb. Uh, he was, this guy was very luxurious, if you will. He had an entire mountain created. He had a tomb underground where he floated on a, a river of mercury. Uh, and, and we'll learn more about him in this really good video that we'll, uh, that I'm going to make you guys watch. So I won't go into a, a lot of detail with him. Um, now, the next dynasty, and, and when his son takes over, the people were so angry um, at everything that Shi Wangdi had done that they're, they're going to kill the son and, and the dynasty is going to come to an end. The, uh, the next dynasty that comes in is called the Han Dynasty, and it ruled for over 400 years, one of the longest lasting dynasties in Chinese history. Um, it was founded by a man named Liu Bang, so make sure you know him. And historians often divide the time period up into two parts, the former Han uh, and later Han. They had this very small period in the middle where they were broken up by uh, a guy. We'll talk about it here in just a minute. Um, the founder of the Han Dynasty was the martial emperor known as Han Wudi. Um, he was their, or, I'm sorry, <laughs> founded by Liu Bang. Uh, the greatest emperor uh, in the Han Dynasty was a man by the name of Han Wudi, who was known as the Martial Emperor, very military minded. Um, he was emperor for 54 years, so he had a, an enormous impact. Even though he wasn't a fan of education himself, he did promote it. He believed in its importance for other people, at least, if not himself. Um, he adapted Confucianism and kind of based the, the Chinese education system off of Confucianism. And Confucianism would be the basis of Chinese education for hundreds of years, a very, very long time. Um, his greatest struggle was against the, uh, the Xiangshu, this nomadic uh, Turkish-speaking tribe to the north, kind of out there where the Mongolians would come from, Central Asia, all those horse riders and dangerous, dangerous people out there. Um, the deadliest of them being Maladun, who um, I'll share a story with you about him in class uh, that's pretty interesting, but I, I, I won't put it on this video here. Uh, overall, you should know that society in China in this time period was incredibly patriarchal, very male-dominated. Uh, there was a book, very famous book that came out in this time called The Abonitions for Women. and basically taught women their place or their role in society, what, how they were supposed to treat their men, how they were supposed to treat their sons, all that kind of stuff. Uh, definitely wouldn't fly in today's society by any means. Um, they were improving iron products. We'd had iron for a little while, but they were they were doing better things with iron than anyone else. Silk production is kicking up. The Han are uh, very efficient with silk production. It's going to make them very wealthy. The Silk Roads is going to blow up in this time period, in this classical time period. They also invent paper. No more writing on bamboo or silk. Uh, they're going to write on paper, which is cheaper and uh, a lot easier than writing on bamboo. Um, there is an enormous gap between the rich and the poor in this time period that begins to increase, and that's going to lead to a lot of social tensions and political tensions as well. Uh, it's, it's all about land distribution. Um, there are very few people that actually own all the land, and that is a source. You know, everyone's either a slave or a serf. You know, somebody who's working on someone else's land and having to pay them taxes. Now, I told you that there was the former Han and the later Han. There was a man by the name of Wang Mang, also known as the usurper, he usurped the crown. Uh, the legitimate ruler was about six years old, and Wang Meng decided that he would go ahead and rule instead. And he was kind of known as the socialist emperor. He has these grand ambitions that he's going to take land from the rich and disperse it to the poor. 
and, and make kind of this equal distribution of land makes a lot of the rich and powerful very unhappy and as you'll find with Julius Caesar you make the rich and powerful unhappy and you get assassinated okay so uh, he will go away and the Han Dynasty will take back control and that will be the later Han Dynasty however they were weakened yeah, their there's rebellions against them because of the gap between the rich and the poor the yellow turban uprising you need to know um, because of the yellow turbans that they wore uh, they were protesting the gap between the rich and the poor, that the, the rich were so enormously wealthy, but most, the vast majority of people, 99% of them are, are just dirt poor. And so that's going to weaken the Han Dynasty, and you're going to see the Han Dynasty will end up falling, and that will bring to a close the classical period in Chinese history. Thank you.